welcome to Book Spot. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will continue our reading of Citizen of the Galaxy by Robert Heinlein. Thorby has lost his foster father Baslam to political violence and is now trying to deliver his last message to the man it's meant for. This means hiding. Chapter 6 The skipper of the Sisu showed up that evening. Captain Krause was tall, fair, rugged, and had the worry wrinkles and grim mouth of a man used to authority and responsibility. He was irked with himself and everyone for having allowed himself to be lured away from his routine by nonsense. His eye assessed Thorby unflatteringly. Mother Shalm, is this the person who insisted that he had an urgent business with me? The captain spoke nine worlds trade lingo, a degenerate form of Sargonese, uninflected and with a rudimentary physicianal grammar. But Thorby understood it. He answered, if you are Captain Fjallar Krause, I have a message for you, noble sir. Don't call me noble sir. I'm Captain Krause, yes. Yes, noble, uh, yes, Captain. You have a message, give it to me. Yes, Captain. Thorby started reciting the message he had memorized, using the Suomish version to Krause. To Captain Fjallar Krause, master of starship Sisu from Baslam the Cripple, Greetings, old friend. Greetings to your family, clan, and Sib, and my humblest respects to your revered mother. I am speaking to you through the mouth of my adopted son. He does not understand Suomic. I address you privately. When you receive this message, I am already dead. Krause had started to smile. Now he let out an exclamation. Thorby stopped. Mother Shalm interrupted with, What's he saying? What language is that? Krause brushed it aside. It's my language. Is what he says true? Is what true? How would I know? I don't understand that yammer. Uh, sorry, sorry. He tells me that an old beggar who used to hang around the plaza, Baslin, he called himself, is dead. Is this true? Eh? Of course it is. I could have told you if I had known you were interested. Everybody knows it. Everybody but me, apparently. What happened to him? He was shortened. Shortened? Why? She shrugged. How would I know? The word is he died or poisoned himself for something before they could question him. So how would I know? I'm just a poor old woman trying to make an honest living with prices getting higher every day. The Sargon's police don't confide in me. But if... Never mind. He managed to cheat them, did he? That sounds like him. He turned to Thorby. Go on, finish your message. Thorby, thrown off stride, had to go back to the beginning. Krause waited patiently until he reached, I am already dead. My son is the only thing of value of which I die possessed. I entrust him to your care. I ask that you succor and admonish him as if you were I. When opportunity presents, I ask that you deliver him to the commander of any vessel of the hegemonic guard, saying that he is a distressed citizen of the hegemony and entitled as such to their help in locating his family. If they will bestir themselves, they can establish his identity and restore him to his people. All the rest I leave to your good judgment. I have enjoined him to obey you, and I believe that he will. He is a good lad within the limits of his age and experience, and I entrust him to you with a serene heart. Now I must depart. My life has been long and rich. I am content. Farewell. The captain chewed his lip, and his face worked in the fashion of a grown man who is busy not crying. Finally, he said gruffly, That's clear enough. Well, lad, are you ready? Sir, you're coming with me, or didn't Baslam tell you? No, sir. He told me to do whatever you told me to do. I'm to come with you? Yes. How soon can you leave? Thorby gulped. Right now, sir. Then come on. I want to get back to my ship. He looked Thorby up and down. Mother Shalm, can we put some decent clothes on him? That outlandish rig won't do to come aboard in. Or, never mind, there's a slop shop down the street. I'll pick him up a kit. She had listened with growing amazement. Now she said, you're taking him to your ship? 
Any objections? Huh? Not at all. If you don't care if they rack him apart, what do you mean? Are you crazy? There are six snoopers between here and the spaceport gate, each one anxious to pick up the reward. You mean he's wanted? Why do you think I've hidden him in my own bedroom? He's as hot as bubbling cheese. But why? Again, how would I know? He is. You don't really think that a lad like this would know enough about what old Baslam was doing to make it... Let's not speak about what Baslam was doing or did. I'm a loyal subject of the Sargon, with no wish to be shortened. You say you want to take the boy into your ship. I say fine. I'll be happy to be quit of the worry. But how? Krause cracked his knuckles one by one. I had thought, he said slowly, that it would be just a matter of walking him down to the gate and paying his emigration tax. It's not, so forget it. Is there any way to get him aboard without passing him through the gate? Krause looked worried. They're so strict about smuggling here that if they catch you, they confiscate the ship. You're asking me to risk my ship and myself and my whole crew. I'm not asking you to risk anything. I've got myself to worry about. I was just telling you the straight score. If you ask me, I'd say you were crazy to attempt it. Thorvey said, Captain Krause? Eh? What is it, lad? Pop told me to do as you said, but I'm sure he never meant you to risk your neck on my account. He swallowed. I'll be all right. Krause sawed the air impatiently. No, no, he said harshly. Baslam wanted this done, and debts are paid. Debts are always paid. I don't understand. No need for you to. But Baslam wanted me to take you with me, so that's how it's got to be. He turned to Mother Schaum. The question is how. Any ideas? Mm, possibly. Let's go talk it over, she turned. Get back in your hideaway, Thorby, and be careful. I may have to go out for a while. Shortly before curfew the next day, a large sedan chair left Joy Street. A patrolman stopped it, and Mother Shalm stuck her head out. He looked surprised. Going out, Mother? Who'll take care of your customers? Murrah has the keys, she answered, but keep an eye on the place, there's a good friend. She's not as firm with him as I am. She put something in his hand, and he made it disappear. I'll do that. Going to be gone all night? I hope not. Perhaps I'd better have a street pass, do you think? I'd like to come straight home if I finish my business. Well, now they've tightened up a little on street passes. Still looking for the beggar's boy? As a matter of fact, yes, but we'll find him. If he's fled to the country, they'll starve him out. If he's still in town, we'll run him down. Well, you could hardly mistake me for him, so how about a short pass for an old woman who needs to make a private call? She rested her hand on the door. The edge of a bill stuck out. He glanced at it and glanced away. Is midnight late enough? Plenty, I should think. He took out his book and started writing, tore out the form, and handed it to her. As she accepted it, the money disappeared. Don't make it later than midnight. Earlier, I hope. He glanced inside the sedan chair, then looked over her entourage. The four bearers had been standing patiently, saying nothing, which was not surprising, since they had no tongues. Zena the garage? I always trade there. I thought I recognized them. Well matched. Better look them over. One of them might be the beggar's boy. Those great hairy brutes get along with your mother. Hail, hail, shawl. The chair swung up and moved away at a trot. As they rounded the corner, she slowed them to a walk and drew all curtains. Then she patted the cushions billowing around her. Doing all right? I'm squashed, a voice answered faintly. Better squashed than shortened. I'll ease over a bit. Your lap is bony. For the next mile, she was busy modifying her costume and putting on jewels. She veiled her face until only her live black eyes showed. Finish, she stuck her head out and called instructions to the head porter. The chair swung right toward the spaceport. When they reached the road girdling its high, impregnable fence, it was almost dark. The gate for spacemen is at the foot of Joy Street. The gate for passengers is east of there in the Emigration Control Building. Beyond that, in the warehouse district, is the Trader's Gate, freight and outgoing customs. Miles beyond are shipyard gates. 
but between the shipyards and traders' gates is a small gate reserved for nobles rich enough to own space yachts. The chair reached the spaceport fence short of Trader's Gate, turned, and went along the fence toward it. Trader's Gate is several gates, each a loading dock built through the barrier so that a warehouse truck can back up, unload. The Sargon's inspectors can weigh, measure, grade, prod, open, and ray the merchandise as may be indicated before it slides across the dock into spaceport trucks on the other side to be delivered to waiting ships. This night, Dock 3 of the gate had its barricade open. Free Trader Sisu was finishing loading. Her master watched, arguing with inspectors and oiling their functioning in the immemorial fashion. A ship's junior officer helped him, keeping tally with pad and pencil. The sedan chair weaved among waiting trucks and passed close to the dock. The master of the Sisu looked up as the veiled lady in the chair peered out at the activity. He glanced at his watch and spoke to his junior officer. One more load, Jan. You go in with a loaded truck and I'll follow with the last one. Aye, aye, sir. The young man climbed on the tail of the truck and told the driver to take it away. An empty truck pulled into its place. It loaded quickly as the ship's master seemed to find fewer things to argue about with the inspectors. Then he was not satisfied and demanded that it be done over. The boss stevedore was pained, but the master soothed him, glanced at his watch again, and said, There's time. I don't want these crates cracked before we get them into the ship. The stuff costs money, so let's do it right. The sedan chair had moved on along the fence. Shortly it was dark. The veiled lady looked at the glowing face of her finger watch and urged her bearers into a trot. They came at last to the gate reserved for nobles. The veiled lady leaned her head out and snapped, Open up! There were two guards on the gate, one in a little watch room, the other lounging outside. The one outside opened the gate, but placed his staff across it when the sedan chair started to go through. Stopped, the bearers lowered it to the ground with the right hand or door side facing into the gate. The veiled lady called out, Clear the way, you, Lord Marlin's yacht! The guard blocking the gate hesitated. My lady has a pass? Are you a fool? If my lady has no pass, he said slowly, perhaps my lady will suggest some way to assure the guard that my Lord Marlin is expecting her? The veiled lady was a voice in the dark. The guard had sense enough not to shine the light in her face. He had long experience of nobles and fumed. If you insist on being a fool, call my lord at his yacht, phone him, and I trust you'll find you've pleased him. The guard in the watch room came out. Trouble, Sean? Uh, no. They held a whispered consultation. The junior went inside to phone Lord Marlin's yacht while the other waited outside. But it appeared that the lady had had all the nonsense she was willing to endure. She threw open the door of the chair, burst out, and stormed into the watch room with the other, guard, other startled guard after her. The one making the call stopped punching keys with connection uncompleted and looked up and felt sick. This was even worse than he had thought. This was no flighty young girl escaped from her chaverones. This was an angry dowager, the sort with enough influence to break a man to common labor, or worse, with a temper that made her capable of it. He listened open-mouthed to the richest tongue-lashing it had been his misfortune to endure in all the years he had been checking lords and ladies through their gate. While the attention of both guards was monopolized by Mother Shalm's rich rhetoric, a figure detached itself from the sedan chair, faded through the gate, and kept going, until it was lost in the gloom of the field. As Thorby ran, he, even as he expected the burning tingle of a stun-gun bolt in his guts, he watched for a road on the right, joining the one from the gate. When he came to it, he threw himself down and lay panting. Back at the gate, Mother Shalm stopped for breath. My lady, one of them said placatingly, if you will just let us complete the call. Forget it. No, remember it, for tomorrow you'll hear from my Lord Marlin. She flounced back to her chair. Please, my lady. She ignored them, spoke sharply to the slaves. They swung the chair up and broke into a trot. 
One guard's hand went to his belt as a feeling of something badly wrong possessed him. But his hand stopped. Right or wrong, knocking down a lady's bearer was not to be risked no matter what she might be up to. After all, she hadn't actually done anything wrong. When the master of the Sisu finally okayed the loading of the last truck, he climbed onto its bed, waved the driver to start, then worked his way forward. Hey there, he knocked on the back of the cab. Yes, Captain, the driver's voice came through faintly. There's a stop sign where this road joins the one out to the ships. I notice most of you drivers don't bother with it. That one? There's never any traffic on that road. That road is just to stop because the nobles use it. Well, that's what I mean. One of them might pop up and I'll miss my jump time just for a silly traffic accident with one of your nobles. They could hold me here for many nine days, so come to a full stop, will you? Whatever you say, Captain, you're paying the bill. So I am. A half-stellar note went through a crack in the cab. When the truck slowed, Krause went to the tailgate. As it stopped, he reached down and snaked Thorby inside. Quiet. Thorby nodded and trembled. Krause took tools from his pockets, attacked one of the crates. Shortly, he had one side open, burlap pulled back, and he started dumping Virga leaves, priceless on any other planet. Soon, he had a largish hole, and a hundred pounds of valuable leaves were scattered over the plain. Get in. Thorby crawled into the space, made himself small. Krause pulled burlap over him, sewed it, crimped slats back into place, and finished by strapping it and sealing it with a good imitation of the seal used by the inspectors. It was handcrafted product of his ship's machine shop. He straightened up and wiped sweat from his face. The truck was turning into the loading circle for the Sisu. He supervised the final loads himself, with the Sargon's field inspector at his elbow, checking off each crate, each bale, each carton, as it went into the sling. Then Krause thanked the inspector appropriately and rode the sling up instead of the passenger hoist. Since a man was riding it, the hoist man let the sling down with more than usual care. The hold was almost filled and stowed for jump. There was very little headroom. Crewmen started wrestling crates free of the sling, and even the captain lent a hand, at least to the extent of one crate. Once the sling was dragged clear, they closed the cargo door and started dogging it for space. Captain Krause reached into his pocket again and started tearing open that crate. Two hours later, Mother Shalm stood at her bedroom window and looked out across the spaceport. She glanced at her watch. A green rocket rose from the control tower. Seconds later, a column of white light climbed to the sky. When the noise reached her, she smiled grimly and went downstairs to supervise the business. Mura couldn't really handle it properly alone. Chapter 7 Inside the first few million miles, Thorby was unhappily convinced he had made a mistake. He passed out from inhaling fumes of Virgo leaves and awakened in a tiny one-bunk stateroom. Waking was painful. Although the Sisu maintained one standard gravity of internal field throughout a, throughout a jump, his body had recognized both the slight difference from jubal surface gravity and the more subtle difference between an artificial field and a natural one. His body decided that he was in the hold of a slaver, and threw him into the first nightmare he had had in years. Then his tired, fume-sodden brain took a long time struggling up out of the horror. At last he was awake, aware of his surroundings, and concluded that he was aboard the Sisu and safe. He felt a glow of relief and gathering excitement that he was traveling and going somewhere. His grief over Baslam was pushed aside by strangeness and change. He looked around. The compartment was a cube, only a foot or so higher and wider than his own height. He was resting on a shelf that filled half the room, and under him was a mattress, strangely and delightfully soft, of material warm and springy and smooth. 
He stretched and yawned in surprised wonder that traders lived in such luxury. Then he swung his feet over and stood up. The bunk swung noiselessly up and fitted itself into the bulkhead. Thorby could not puzzle out how to open it again. Presently he gave up. He did not want a bed then. He did want to look around. When he woke, the ceiling was glowing faintly. When he stood up, it glowed brightly and remained so. But the light did not show where the door was. There were vertical metal panels on three sides, any of which might have been a door, save that none displayed thumb slot, hinge, or other familiar mark. He considered the possibility that he had been locked in, but was not troubled. Living in a cave, working in the plaza, he was afflicted neither with claustrophobia nor agoraphobia. He simply wanted to find the door and was annoyed that he could not recognize it. If it were locked, he did not think that Captain Krause would let it stay locked unduly long, but he could not find it. He did find a pair of shorts and a singlet on the deck. When he woke, he had been bare the way he usually slept. He picked up these garments, touched them timidly, wondered at their magnificence. He recognized them as being the sort of thing most spacemen wore, and for a moment let himself be dazzled at the thought of wearing such luxuries. But his mind shied away from such impudence. Then he recalled Captain Krause's distaste at his coming aboard in the clothes he normally wore. Why, the captain had even intended to take him to a tailoring shop in Joy Street, which catered to spacemen. He had said so. Thorby concluded that these clothes must be for him. For him? His breech clout was missing, and the captain certainly had not intended him to appear in the sea suit naked. Thorby was not troubled by modesty. The taboo was spotty on Jubal, and applied more to the upper classes. Nevertheless, clothes were worn. Marveling at his own daring, Thorby tried them on. He got the shorts on backwards, figured out his mistake, and put them on properly. He got the pullover shirt on backwards, too, but the error was not as glaring. He left it that way, thinking he had done it right. Then he wished mightily he could see himself. Both garments were of simple cut, undecorated light green, and fashioned of strong, cheap material. They were working clothes from the ship's slop chest, a type of garment much used by both sexes on many planets through many centuries. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as Thorby. He smoothed the cloth against his skin and wanted someone to see him in his finery. He set about finding the door with renewed eagerness. It found him. While running his hands over the panels on one bulkhead, he became aware of a breeze, turned, and found that one panel had disappeared. The door led out into a passageway. A young man dressed much as Thorby was, Thorby was overjoyed to find he had dressed properly for the occasion, was walking down the curved corridor toward Thorby. Thorby stepped out and spoke a greeting in Sargonese trade talk. The man's eyes flicked toward Thorby, then he marched on past as if no one was there. Thorby blinked, puzzled and a little hurt. Then he called out to the receding back in interlingua. No answer, and the man disappeared before he could try other languages. Thorby shrugged and let it roll off. A beggar does not gain by being touchy. He set out to explore. And we will find out what his explorations uncover next time.